morning, everybody. How we doing? Oh, awesome. All right, so uh, my name is Chris Pleckenpole. If you're new or like this is your first time or you just forgot my name, Chris Pleckenpole is my name. I'm the lead pastor here at Wells Branch Community Church. So glad you're here. And we're in the middle or rather at the end of a series to open up this year called Family Membership where we're kind of, it's like, you guys remember college, for those of you going to college, you had like orientation week. Uh, and you like they told you about the syllabus, and they told you about all the cool things that happened at the school. Well, that's sort of what we've been doing here for the past four weeks. Uh, first week, we, we've actually we've been going over all, not all, some of the metaphors that God uses in his word to describe his church. And the first week, we talked about how we are a flock of sheep, and that uh, we are known because we are a people or sheep who know the voice of the shepherd. And so our ability to connect with God and our ability to hear his voice, read his word, and obey him is what marks us as his. And then the next week, we talked about how uh, the church is like a body and how every body part is needed, even like ankles and MCLs and all body parts are, are valuable and the body needs all its parts and if you disconnect the body from its parts you have an autopsy and not a body and then the following week we talked about how uh, we are an embassy okay we are an embassy and that we are ambassadors of the embassy and we have a mission all right and we are an enemy territory and the enemy is not people but rather the spiritual forces of darkness in this present world and we as the ambassadors of the embassy have a message to people who are enslaved by darkness that God has made a way for them to be reconciled. And now this week, we're going to talk about family. And this is a sort of a big metaphor for us because we call ourselves a family of believers committed to reaching people with the life-changing reality of Jesus Christ. And that's where we're going to start off in, in this sort of message this morning is we're going to talk about the metaphor that God uses over and over again that we our family. In fact, uh, God says that we cry out to God. Whenever we become a Christian, when we believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, rose from the dead, and we receive that, we get to call, call God our Father. And there's something in us that cries out to Him. And it's really important that we know how families work then, if we're going to be like a family. But the problem is, in our culture, let's just face it, we haven't done really good in the family department. Okay, let's just think about the way you grew up. Let's just, I'm just going to take you Think about you and your family. And Adrian and I, uh, we are, we're a family of four now, which is kind of bizarre to think about. We're a family of four. Who would have thought that would have, I'm like, I was a family of one not too long ago, and it's just bizarre. Like, who are these other people? All right. Uh, and so now we're a family of four, and so Adrian and I are coming up with our traditions, our very own, like, things about who we are. And it, it's really caused me to think about, like, what even makes up a family. And so I, as I was thinking about this, I thought about my own family, like, growing up. And the first thing that sort of comes up to my mind is the relationships. And you're like, well, duh, uh, you have a relationship with your mom and your dad, or maybe you don't. Okay, so maybe you don't. Like, you, could, you, you have a biological father and mother, but you may not have a relationship with them. All right? And so for me, um, I had a really great relationship with my mom, and my dad was one of those guys who had a hard time connecting, and his dad died when he was like two, and so he didn't have, know how to connect to his dad uh, as a you know, son to a father, and so he had no kind of idea how to connect to a father to a son, and so there was a, that kind of a missing piece for me, relationally. And I was an only child. How many other only, only children are here? Yeah, yeah, we are strong and proud, and listen, it was a miserable life, okay? All right, so all you guys were judging us because we had sweet birthday parties. Let me tell you something. We would have loved to have some friends along the way because it got lonely. All right, that was for free, and you, we can commiserate as only children. All right, the next thing that you, that, as a part of your family in the relationships is experiences. Now, experiences, uh, for a lot of you, were family vacations, or at least in, in my family, it was like going to sports events, or going to hotels to watch sports events in other cities, because we didn't have, like, direct TV or anything. You guys with me? So we'd go find a place that would have our team, and my dad and I would go and, like, watch that, and we would talk about the sporting event, and our conversations were relegated to uh, the 1985 Chicago Bears and how amazing they were. All right, yeah. Man, it's good to know some Chicagoans are in the house. Okay, so that was kind of like what life revolved around in, in some circumstances for experiences. And, and for some of you who may, maybe didn't have um, like strong relationships, you grew up with great experiences and, or maybe hard experiences and you grew up being hard. And you can now deal with really hard situations, but you don't trust people. All right, and then the, the, the final component of this is values, all right, values. 
And this is like knowing right from wrong, uh, whether you value being on time or not, uh, whether you value uh, your, your value of money, work ethic, all that stuff comes from your family of origin initially, and then you're sort of morphed into life later on. And so for me, uh, for example, my mom was psycho about time. Like if you were, if it was, if I said I'd be home at 7 and it was 7.02, it was like, you know you're late, right? You, you, you said 7 and it's 7.02. And I'd be like, but it's, so the discussions that Adrian and I have are about being on time. So we take separate cars. All right, so there we go. That solves that. So what happens is, is like who you are, your family of origin affects like your values, it affects the way you deal with people, and it affects the way you want to experience things, okay? And so, for example, if you had, um, maybe you had parents uh, that were like super relational, they like really loved each other, and, and they were, had awesome experiences, but like zero values, you had the cool parents. How many guys know what I'm talking about when I talk about cool parents? They're the ones that say like, hey, you can party over here, just don't, you know, like, that's cool, and here's a condom, and like, you know, just don't, if you drink too much, just let me know, and we'll make sure everyone gets home okay. Like, uh, like that might have been your family experience, uh, the cool parent. Or, or maybe um, you grew up, and the, the thing that was really awesome about that, you bragged about being the cool parent, but like when stuff went bad, like when life started to fall apart because nobody had any values, then you had nothing to fall back on and for right and wrong, and you just did whatever the heck you could think of to kind of maintain it, and you made things probably a lot worse, okay? That was, that's what happened if you had cool parents. Uh, let's say you had relationships and values, then you were the people that judged people everywhere. Like, you, like you had a, a great relationship with your parents, and like you had a standard of right and wrong, and then you would just go around with your parents just talking about how um, fat, how terrible those, they were dressed, how... Uh, you could just kind of tell people how they were, and, you know, you kind of had a moment with that. Like, oh, aren't we so glad we're not like them? <laughs> Son, don't ever be like them. And so you learn to value certain things and how to judge people, okay? Uh, and it made you a not very nice person, but once you're in, you're in. It's great. And then on the, on the flip side of that, there are those who are, have sweet experiences and um, really great values. And that was probably like you, your, your parents really valued work and doing really cool things, but you had zero relationship. And so you, had, you knew about work ethic, and you knew about having a really awesome time, but how to interact, how to talk about dating, how to about like, you know, all the stuff about like, what, what career should I choose? What, if it didn't kind of revolve around the, the systematic value of like making money and having awesome experiences, for you, it might have felt like shallow and hollow. So the, the, you need to have all three to be healthy. And here's what I, I learned about myself. I didn't realize that would affect me and the way I viewed church. Isn't that weird? This, your family of origin, will affect the way you view church, especially when we start calling God Father. And we start talking about Brother Chris and Sister Adrian. You know, now, and you got cultish on that one. You got weird out when people start calling Brother Chris. We do too, but that's cool. Like, but it's a thing. Like, it, we're, like, we're like family. Uh, if you're a Christian, you're like family. And so what we've seen is, is that your family of origin affects the way you view church. It affects the way you view church. And if you've had some cruddy family experiences, most likely you're going to be biased towards church and you're going to judge it before you walk in the building. Okay? So I wanted us to kind of get a proper view of our own family. Okay? Our own family. Our messed up own family or our awesome family. If you had like the perfect family, had all three of those. And then see how God's family ultimately heals and redeems the brokenness from which we came. And it's a better version of even the greatest thing that you could possibly ever hope to have. Your own family is even better when it's a Christian family and when you have a family of believers. And we're going to learn this morning what, how those components interact from our family of origin to what it means to be a church family. Okay, you guys with me? That's where we're going. We're going to be a part of scripture you've probably never read. I'm just, I'm just put, banking on the fact you've probably never read this and you skipped over it every single time. We're going to be in Romans chapter 16. Huh? Yeah, you guys have never read that. You've skipped it. All right, so Romans 16. If you don't have a Bible, I want you to raise your hand in the air, wave it like you do care, and a Bible will come to you. In fact, if you don't have a Bible at all, this is our gift to you. If you forgot yours today, I want you to open up God's Word, and I want you to look at it, and you can borrow ours for the time being, and then we'll roll right through Romans chapter 16. We're talking about being a member of God's family. 
And before we just jump into Romans 16, which is going to be on page 950 in the Bibles we passed out, uh, Paul is writing this amazing theological treatise on like what it is to know about our faith. I mean, he's going hardcore doctrine, and it's awesome. But at the end, we see he, he can't help but talk about the people that have been interacting with him, and this is where we learn about Paul's family. And Paul was a single dude, and he still had family. Okay, so those of you who are single, you're like, doesn't apply to me. I'm single, I'm 23, and I don't care. Now listen, you have family, and that's kind of like, we got to learn how to do this before you jump into another family. Are you guys with me? Here we go. Romans chapter 16, verse 1. I commend to you our sister Phoebe. Here it is, sister Phoebe. This again, this is brother Bill, sister Phoebe. And it, again, don't go awkward on me. This doesn't have to be a 1950s Baptist, Baptist church. This is just sister Phoebe. She is a Christian, so therefore in the family, and she gets the title sister. I commend you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Centra. Now, Centra is about nine miles away from Corinth, where Paul was probably writing this letter and hanging out with the Corinthian church. And uh, she's the one that gets tasked to take this letter. So he's like, hey, I commend you our sister Phoebe, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need from you. So apparently Phoebe is a businesswoman, the term here, is she's into some pragmatic work that she's going to be doing in Rome, and she's going to need some help. For she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. And um, patron, that's not a normal word, is it? I mean, like, don't patronize me. That's usually the only way we use it. A patron is a benefactor, somebody who sponsors somebody else. Uh, in our culture today, I think the best way to put it is a venture capitalist. How many of you guys know what a venture capitalist is? All right, so it's a person who's going to invest money into a company, into a person, like especially an entrepreneur, like they're going to put some money into this entrepreneur and they're going to go for it. Here's a couple million, go make a lot of money. All right, but what it is, it's an investment. It's somebody who invests in somebody else and ultimately that gain isn't going to be seen in the short term, it's a long-term gain. So Phoebe, who's a person of wealth, she's a wealthy woman, she becomes a Christian, is trans her whole life is transformed, and she interacts with Paul, and Paul's like, let me tell you something, you, you're a businesswoman, let me tell you where to put your money. Here are some people that you can invest in. And so she starts investing in the work of the church. And now, I was really sort of hesitant to sort of bring this up, because usually when people go like, oh, good, rich people fund the church. <laughs> okay. And usually we just go like, oh, well, I'm not rich, so I'm good. Listen, here's the thing about that, is that she funded like perhaps eight, nine people, including Paul. And the weird thing is about this is whenever you, you read about Phoebe and you think, well, only rich people fund the church, you are the rich people. You know what, how I know that? You have struggles with your mortgage. You have struggles with your car payments. You have a house and you have cars, <laughs> plural. All right, and so the reality is that you are part of the richest 1% in the entire planet and so what we need to do is get ourselves out of this mindset that I'll start giving once I've made it. The greatest investment you could ever make is in God's work into the kingdom to push back the darkness. And that's what Phoebe saw, and that's what she invested in. So I can, I can already hear the people, oh, here we go. That's why I don't do church. Just talk about money. <laughs> now listen, if I didn't talk about money, if I didn't talk about money, I would be a terrible pastor. Because isn't it true your idol, let's just, our idol is money and security and power, and like, I want to get what I want when I want because I'm an American. Th that's our deal. So if I don't kind of slam at the idol of our culture, then I'm a poor pastor, and you should, uh, like, say, get out of here. I want somebody who's going to convict me of the truth of God's word. Okay, so that's just, that was for free. That was a rant. Uh, so, like, the, here it is. Phoebe is a person who is a servant and feels like it's her pleasure and joy to serve the church through her giving and through her doing and going. Okay, so what? Watch this. And the thing about Phoebe, she's traveling on Roman roads in ancient Near Eastern culture. That's, exact, that's a freaky place to do it because although the roads were like brand new, it was a place where bandits and the, like the, you know, there weren't any like state troopers patrolling. This is a place when you were traveling by foot, you would get robbed. And here she is. She's the one that Paul entrusts with his theological treaties to the Roman church saying, well, make sure that they get this. Pretty powerful stuff. And she goes, risking it. Verse 3. Greet Prisca, 
and Aquila. Now, Prisca, you can tell is a term of endearment because her actual name is Priscilla. Anytime you shorten somebody's name from Priscilla to Prisca, you got to love them because that's just a weird name, Prisca. All right, greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul met Aquila at like the tent-making chamber of commerce back in Ephesus. And so they, would, they hung out, and they built tents together, and Paul led him to faith in Christ, and they would go around leading other people to, to Jesus. And uh, his wife, Priscilla, were totally into this. And they become fellow workers, and then watch this. Verse 3, they risk their necks for my life. In fact, if you're wondering where the term, you know, I, risk, I put my life in line, I risk my neck for you, that's from the Bible. That's for free for your Jeopardy quiz on Bible trivia later. Who risk their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Their risk was the Gentile church's reward. Greet also the church in their house. Greet my beloved Epinetus, who was the first convert to Christ in Asia. There's another history moment there for Jeopardy. Greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, this married couple. My kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. They go to prison and have this incredible experience with Paul in prison. I mean, you get close to people in prison, but it's the experience that drives that. And they are all well known to the apostles, and they were in Christ before me. Now, here's a list of names and kind of talking about all the stuff they do. This is what Christians do. Christians share meaningful experiences with church family. So let me just kind of list some of the things out. Uh, to be a part of the church, to be a part of the church family, you give to it. You do. And you go. You, you go and give. It's just part of it. Phoebe, she goes. Phoebe, she gives. And she, there's a risk factor involved. Isn't it true? Isn't it true? The risk factor involved when you give to the local church, you're saying, I have the security in cash. And I'm going to give it to God, trusting that you are going to provide and take care of me. Isn't that cool? Like, this is, this is my greatest, like, faith experiences have been when I'm like, all right, I'm a brand new Christian. I'm like, so I'm going to take, I, you know, I make 30000 a year as a new lieutenant, and I'm going to give that money to Jesus. And by starting then at 23, it transformed my life. And my, my mom was like, you are insane. Why would you ever do that? Because she never did. Why would you ever do that? That's a poor investment. That's the, the, your ROI, your return of investment is weak when you give it to the church unless you have a kingdom agenda. And your risk is rewarded by what God is going to do in and through the church as the kingdom advances and you get to watch it happen because you were faithful. All right, going. There's something that we do here. We, you know, the, I just go, we even mentioned prison. We go to prison here. We go to prison. We go to strip clubs. Ladies do. Uh, we go to uh, our community. We go to our neighbors. We go. And we have this incredible experience, and it's always freaky to share the gospel. I was with, we had like an interfaith dialogue yesterday with some Muslims that live in Wells Branch. And listen, it's a little unnerving when you're like, listen, um, I believe pretty much everything different than you believe, and that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, and he rose from the dead. That's an awkward experience, but it's, it's a something that grows my own faith when I have an experience with like this Muslim community who are going, so tell me about Jesus again. That's awesome. And so what we do here as a part of this church, we go into the darkness because we know that Muslims aren't our enemy. It's the spiritual forces of darkness. We know atheists aren't our enemy. It's the spiritual forces of darkness. And so we push it back by giving truth and love. Okay. And this, this thing of risking it becomes super important because if you don't have an element of risk, you're not going to have an element of growth. This, this is the part of it where for some of you, Christianity is really boring. And if it's boring, this is going to sound odd. You're doing it wrong. Because if there is no risk, if there is no like God has convicted me to trust him in this experience of I'm going to talk to somebody. I don't do talking to people. I'm going to give. I don't give away my money. I'm going to do something that's out of my comfort zone. There is no risk. And of course Christianity is boring. Of course. That's why men have been checked out of church for so long, because there's been no element of danger. Because men, we love danger. <laughs> That's why we love war and going to, I mean, they don't love war, but we do. I mean, there, every time I roll out in the sector in, in Iraq, there was a sense I could get killed. There was something really exhilarating about that. Okay, I'm, I'm a little sick and twisted, I know, but 
Hang with me. But it's true. We as men, this is why we play video games about with war. We play, we want to, you know, we always want to be the championship quarterback. We always want to risk it. We want to be on the line where this is, you know, you don't like watching the games where you win 100 to nothing. You like watching the games where the quarterback in the last second has got to make, you know, he's going to make this last second bomb and he's going to hit his receiver in the end zone. We love that stuff because there's risk. And you have risk with experience. For some of you, that experience might just be serving in children's ministry. That's a risk. All right, verse 8, verse 8. Greet Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. Uh, Ampliatus would be a, a slave name, common slave name. And so you're going to watch this. As we walk through this, I'm going to try and pick them out, but you're going to see slaves and citizens all kind of clumped together, which is sort of like this church. Not that we have slaves here, but that we have people on different socioeconomic statuses. We have different racial statuses. We have people all from all the whole spectrum, and that's the church. Just look around for a second. I mean, like, don't judge people how much money they make, but just see it. They're, they're different than you. That's healthy. So here's a slave. Greet Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. This slave is my beloved. Greet Urbanus. He's a citizen. That's a, a citizen name. Our fellow worker in Christ. And my beloved Stachys, probably a slave name. Stachys is a fun name. It means ear of corn. Like, if you were just like, if, that, if you were ever thinking of a name, hey, ear of corn, you're just a little corny to me. It's just so sweet. Greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Like, do you notice this? There's love. There's pride in people. That's, that's like family relationships. Greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. That would be like a, a wealthy uh, family. Greet my kinsman, Herodian. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus, which is an unfortunate name. It's very narcissistic. narcissistic. Greet those workers in the Lord, Tryphena and Tryphosa, which, because if you can see the, the trife that they're sisters, I mean, dignity and dignified, or, and kind of an odd wording, but they're probably most likely to think they're twins of well means. Greet the beloved Persis, who's probably from Persia, uh, who has worked hard in the Lord, and then greet Rufus. You're probably wondering who Rufus is, unless you've watched Dogma. All right, don't go there. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, also whose mother, who's been a mother to me as well. Who's Rufus? Do you guys know who Rufus is? I'm going to tell you who Rufus is. He's in the Bible, other than this. Do you guys remember when Jesus is carrying the cross? Do you guys remember this? And he's about, he's, you know, he's getting beaten. It's bad times for him. All of a sudden, he falls over, and then the Romans go, you, pick up his cross and carry it from him. That was a guy named Simon of Cyrene. And it says in the text, whose sons are Alexander and Rufus. So Rufus is a dad carried the cross for Jesus, okay? And so we know that Simon of Cyrene becomes a believer and that his mother becomes a mother to Paul. Now think about Paul. Do you guys know who Paul is? Paul was also Saul, who kind of was like genocide guy. Let's eliminate all Christians. He was ISIS before ISIS. So Saul will go around arresting Christians and he would have, he would kind of like oversee their public stoning. Thank you very much. And then one day he becomes a Christian. And he goes to the very people whose family he had slaughtered or saw to it that they were dead. And those people, Rufus's mom, comes over to Paul and says, I know you're not like you used to be. You're my boy. Paul in that moment understands deep relationship. Do you see that? He's getting mothered by a person who probably lost people because of Saul, who became Paul's work. And she mothers him and cares for him because that's what Christians do, even to former enemies. That's why I always say, Muslims are not our enemies. Atheists are not our enemy. It's darkness. That's our enemy. Verse 14, greet Asyncretus, Phlegon, Hermes, Patrobas, Hermas, and the brothers who are with them. Greet Philagus, Julia, Nereus, and his sister. You know, you ever do that? You just can't remember somebody's name. This happens to me all the time, so if I can't forget your name, sorry. This is holy inspired forgetfulness. Okay, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Now, guys, this is not a pickup line, all right? 
This is the moment where you are like this, this affection of intimacy where you greet one another. All the churches of Christ greet you. Okay, so there's this like intimacy that's being shared. These are all my, my people that were brothers, were sisters. And then he's going to, and I'm going to skip ahead just to, because this makes sense in context of the, all these relationships. Timothy, my fellow worker. You know, Timothy who's, is a man who Paul calls his son. They've been in prison together. They planted churches together. They lived life together. And Paul instructed him in the way of God. And he taught him and they loved each other and they suffered together. And he calls him his son in the faith. Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you. So do Lucius and Jason and Sospiter, my kinsmen. Whenever you see kinsmen here, it's most likely meaning a Jewish person, someone who's also Jewish. I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. Tertius gets a little name recognition right there for writing it. Gaius, who is host to me and to the whole church, greets you. Erastus, the city treasurer, and our brother Cordus greet you. I want you to see this. Christians have meaningful relationships with church family. All right, this is important. When, when Jesus, he gets with the disciples and he says, hey, listen, I got a new command for you guys that you would love one another. And here, here's the thing about loving one another. It's hard. You know what you have to do with people you love? You have to forgive them. Did, did, is, that, is this news? Like, I, maybe in your family you guys never fought. I know that's, it, it's possible. Um, and in your family you never fought, and you, everybody got along, and your parents were always like, let's have some sugar and candy canes, kids. And I was like, yes, mommy. And like, then you guys had like, you know, it was just wonderful times for everybody. It was like Christmas every day. I'm sure it was like that. Or it wasn't. And you, had, you saw played out before you terrible acts of unforgiveness and how to hold a grudge and how to be angry and how to like make sure you can manipulate people. And you had mothers-in-law that just beat you down with some passive aggressiveness. Have a nice day. <laughs> and you had some ungrateful uh, sons-in-law, daughters-in-law who would just kind of like eat your food and be like, thanks. And there'd be never like a sort of like gratitude. And so, and so we've got to deal with one another because we understand family. And here's the thing about church family. Here's what's happened in the past. Whenever church family offended us, what do we do? Leave. Oh, it's like that, is it? All right, see ya. And we're out. But you can't love somebody unless you love them in sickness and in health. Better and worse, richer and poor. You can't. You got to learn how to forgive. You got to learn how to love. You got to learn how to commiserate. We're fairly decent at commiserating. If you start talking bad about how like, terrible your job is, everyone's like, me too. But the, the thing you know we're, we're sort of bad at is celebrating. My job's awesome. Oh, well, well, well. <laughs> Judgment, right? That's what we do. We can't have somebody have a great job. Like we had, that's the part. We do great at commiserating, not so great at celebrating. We got to celebrate people. You got to raise, yes, even when you got like demoted or fired or let go. I mean, like that's, like, that's where we got to do better at celebrating with one another. Uh, how about this one? We celebrate. We got to be able to share. Share. Did you know, here's what's cool about our, this is why I just want to brag about our church for a second. Did you know we had three people give away cars this December to our church? And you know what was even better than that? We made them fill out all the paperwork and go make sure all that stuff happens. I mean, there's a, man, it's actually very painful to give away your car. And people do that because they want to share with the overabundance that God has given them. Now, I'm not talking about like Bentleys. I'm talking about like cars that like have like, you know, messed up doors and we'll figure that out. We'll put, you know, have to pay $500 to get the door fixed to give away to somebody. But we'll do that because that's what we do. We share. And how about this? We care. And there's a point at which you're going to be sick. You're going to have a child. You're going to be like at your wit's end because you don't sleep because your kids keep you up all night. Um, can I get an amen? <laughs> like you're going to go through some painful time. You're, there's going to be a time when cancer visits and you're going to need someone to help carry the load. That's what Christians do. And that happens because of the relationships you have. We'll get more on that in a second on how important that is. Verse 17. Go back a little bit. I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. So people who say, like, there's some other way to, to heaven, like, you can work really hard. I was, you know, yesterday I was with Muslims. And they're like, here's how you get to heaven. You have all your good deeds and your bad deeds. And if you do more good things than you do bad things, then Allah will accept you. And I'm like, gosh, that's exhausting. I can't keep up with that. 
I mean, what about all my bad thoughts? Do those count? Yeah, those count. Like, who's got time to count all that stuff? All I'd be doing is keeping a ledger. All right, and they said, if, if you smile at somebody, that counts. Well, how much does that count? Does that count, like, is that like if I murdered somebody in my heart, and I then smile, does that cancel it out, or what? I mean, like, someone's got me a grading scale for crying out loud. It was exhausting. I was, that was a full conversation I had in my head. Anyway. And when people come around teaching that sort of nonsense, we got to be like, I'm sorry, this church isn't for you. Because we believe in salvation by grace through faith and that you cannot earn it. It's a gift. And all you have to do is receive that gift. And he starts to change you from the inside out. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their appetites. Because they want to make themselves feel good about how awesome they are. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. And I, naive. And I don't want anyone here to be naive. For your obedience is known to all, so that I rejoice over you. But I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent and as to what, as to what is evil. The God of peace, and I love this line, I love this. And the God of peace will soon crush Satan <laughs> under your feet. <laughs> Isn't that fun? That's what the God of peace does. He crushes him. It kind of reminds me of my tank, and we'd run over like bad guys' cars. It was just really fun. I digress. All right, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Christians share meaningful doctrine with church family, all right? So we have meaningful doctrine, and so that teaches about God, it teaches about us, and it teaches about what we value, all right? So there's a God way to view the world, and when we learn about doctrine, we learn about what Jesus did on the cross. And for those of you who are not Christians, I'm so glad you're here. Here's what we believe about Jesus. He was in heaven before time began. He is and is God and was with God, and he's part of the Trinity. And God sent his son Jesus from heaven to earth, and he died on that cross. And then all of a sudden on that cross, there was separation between Jesus and the Father. And he experienced the separation and the punishment of what that which we should receive because of our dark hearts. And he died. And then he rose from the dead. And he was victorious over death. That's why we don't get it. That's why we're not afraid of cancer. Not because we won't physically die, but because even though we die, we're going to be with him forever. That, that's why we have hope. Okay? And so that doctrine, we need to repeat to ourselves, the number one person you preach the gospel to is you, because you start to forget. Now, here's what happens. I want you to see this. We have these incredible experiences, these incredible relationships, and these incredible values. Now, here's what happens. Here's what happens. Is some, for some of us, we do two of these really well. Like, for example, if you have awesome Christian experiences, and you couple that with a sweet relationships, you know what you have? Fun camp. No, you guys have experienced fun. It's like this awesome time where you go and it's like, woohoo! It's like, and you like, like you, you do a bunch of crying. How many guys went to a youth group, youth camp, and everybody cried last day? Come on, it was like mandatory crying. And you're like, why am I even crying? I don't know, but we're crying, all right. And you know what? You have to remember that you have what? What's this? Friendship bracelet. You know who gave me this friendship bracelet? Bracelet, Phil Kwan. We are friends for life, me and Phil. And every time I look at my friendship bracelet, I remember the time we went to Walmart and we talked about how fun it, funny it is that people wear friendship bracelets. He said, Chris, I'm going to make you a friendship bracelet so you're not so negative about it. And so now I have my Phil Kwan friendship bracelet. Yeah. You know what the problem with having these sweet friendship bracelets are? Without any values or doctrine to back it up, these things fall off. And you're like, that was a cool relationship for a cool time, but... I have no idea where those people are anymore. And when life gets hard, listen, when life gets hard and you don't have another experience and somebody can't relate to you because they haven't been through cancer, they haven't been through like divorce or haven't been through losing a child, they haven't been through all that, then you're like, I got nothing. You need to fall back on your faith. And so if all you have is Christian fun camp, it's lacking. It's lacking. Okay, here's, here's the other one, um, or another one. How about this? You guys remember um, the Christian, for those who have uh, relationships and who also have um, doctrine, you know what you have? A click, all right? And here's how it works. You, you guys have been to churches like this, uh, and hopefully our church isn't like this, but when you get there, everyone's like shouldered off, and they're talking to each other, and when somebody new comes in, they're like, don't look, don't look. All right, check them out. Do they look cool? Do they look cool? All right. I don't know. I don't know. And so what we do is we put up little baby gates. 
Because we're going to protect everybody from the new people. Because you guys are weird. All right? And so, in fact, here's, this is what it looked like when you're in your Christian youth group. We're gonna have, we're gonna, we can't protect, we got to protect everybody from all the bad people. We can't let them in. We got to keep them out. And so, for those of you who are on the outside, you're always on the outside, and you got like a gate in front of you. You're like, well, of course you don't want anything to do with us. We got our sweet little clique, and it's really great. And the parents feel really great because their kids are safe. But all we're doing is we're creating safeguards because we don't want anyone to get the disease of the world. You see that? And it's really dangerous to go into these little clique things. It's like youth group extension. <laughs> and all of a sudden you become adults, and there's somebody new, and you're just exhausted because you don't want to talk to anybody new, and you kind of get off mission. And you're like, well, listen, I, I mean, that'd be a, that's a weird experience. They probably don't need Jesus anyway. I, I mean, I don't have time for that. I don't have time. I got to protect my time. Because, listen, I got, I got family to take care of, and I, listen, I, I get it. I got to protect it. And so instead of having any missional experience, you have zero because we're protecting. And so what happens is, let's just be honest, the, the kids who grow up so protected, they get to college and they've had, since they've had no experience, they're like, they've been lying to me the whole time. I've been sheltered my whole life. I didn't know. Look, I didn't know. Look, look at all these other people who believe differently than me. How this happen? I guess I'm giving up on Christianity. That's what happens. Tell me I'm lying. We got to get rid of those gates. Amen. And here's the last one. Um, if you have sweet Christian experiences, like church, this is pretty awesome, isn't it? Don't we have an awesome experience here? Yeah. Yeah. You can clap for our experience here. I mean, it was an awesome band. And then I get to do a little song and dance. And it is great. And, if, and then if you're like kind of like graduate level awesome, you go to c Christian conferences and then you go and you go to Passion, and then you go to like Weekend to Remember, like marriage conferences, and then you go to, all, and you get smarter and smarter and smarter and smarter. But you know what you don't have? You have no relationship with anybody. In fact, you are the Christian tourist. Here I am. <laughs> Quick selfie. Get me. Here I am at Passion. <laughs> Here I am at church, everybody. Facebook. Here I am at Disney World, love it, look, look, up here, I'm having the experience, look at it. Man, it was just so deep, that teaching that Chris taught, it was amazing, I mean, it was just so like, we went to Romans 16, ching, and like, we have moments, like, and, or, for the, hold on, some of you guys don't know what I'm talking about, remember these? Yeah. Oh yeah, look, here I am. Like, we have all these awesome experiences with our sweet selfie sticks, and we're, we have no relationship. So you know what happens? You know what happens? You have all this, like, knowledge. You have all these experiences, but nobody really knows you. And you know what happens when that happens? Zero life change. So the reality is, here's, here's, here's what you're facing. For a Christian tourist, and this is where I fall. I'm the Christian tourist. The thing that I battle is I don't want any other guy to really know me because then they're going to know I'm a sinner. I'm not perfect, and I've got stuff and issues, and I've got, like, weird issues. I, I don't want to tell anybody that, but I will never grow. Hear me, hear me. I will always be the Christian tourist if I never let somebody in. You will always be in Christian fun camp if you never learn about the deep truths of our faith, which are awesome. And you'll be the worst click, Christian click ever if you have sweet relationships great theology, but you have zero experience. And that's sad. And I want us to be a healthy Christian family. I want us to have all, all of these components within us. And so my, my question this morning is, are you a member of the family? That, that's the question. Are you a member of the family? And what I mean by that is, have you accepted Christ as your Savior? That's my first question. Has there been a time, and don't talk to me about all the churches you attended, like the Baptist church, and then you went to the Presbyterian church, and then the Charismatic church, and you learned how to, like, you know, do ceiling crawling. And, like, uh, like I, love, I love all those church experiences. I love them. But that has no impact on your spiritual life of being born again. I know, weird Christian term, but it's real. Like, you all of a sudden, you're dead, and you're like, man, I'm alive. I'm spiritually alive. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. He rose from the dead. Whoa, I didn't know it could be this good. All right? If you have no idea what I'm talking about, you don't know Jesus. All right, and so what, what I'm talking about is, what, where was that time where you came to know Christ? Okay, and then my second question is, if you are a Christian here, if you're a Christian, are you engaged in meaningful experiences 
relationships, and doctrine. Are you a full picture or are you merely a fun camp Christian, a Christian clique, or a Christian tourist? In fact, um, there's, there's a couple ways that we can get involved here to kind of, if you, if you are one of these things. Um, if you're like the Christian tourist, then I want you, or rather, if you're, if you're in the Christian clique, you need an experience. You need to go outside your own little realm, get around people that it might be a little different, and I want you to go to the men's retreat, men. And ladies, I want you to go to the if gather. So where, where's Amanda? Where are you at, Amanda? Where are you, where'd you go? Are you here somewhere? There you are. Amanda, will you get up and go to the back for me? Amanda is gathering ladies for the if gathering. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, it's a good experience. Get out of your comfort zone and ask her. But it's an experience where you get to encounter God in a powerful way. Where, where's Joe Davis? Where are you at? Joe, would you go back for our men's retreat? I want you, uh, Joe is our elder chair, and he is passionate about men experiencing God and aspiring for more. And maybe this is the retreat you need to go on because, well, you've been in the Christian clique for a while. Or maybe you're the Christian tourist. You're the Christian tourist, and you know what you need? You need community. You need people who really know you. And so I want you to start, sign up for our starting point groups. Ben, over me. Throw your hand in the air. Wave like you care. There, uh, ben is our uh, membership pastor, and he is going to be kind of coordinating our starting point groups. Go see him. If, you, if you've been a Christian tourist your whole life, what's my next step? Having people actually know you. And then finally, for those of you who've been Christian fun camp your whole life, it's like, woohoo! It's been awesome. It's time to go deeper in your faith. Phil, where are you at? Where's Phil? Phil. Go back and see uh, Phil back there on the way back. Or Ben. There's Phil. Go and see him. And I want you to get involved in a grow class. All these things start in February. Every one of these things. How fun is that? Men's retreat's February. If gathering's February. Our starting point classes are February. And our grow classes are February. So welcome to the month of love. Would you guys pray with me? Father, um, I'm so grateful for you. You sent your son, Jesus, to die on that cross. Would not stand against us.